So in this video, we're going to talk about nuclear power plants or fission reactors. So we're going to start off by looking at like a general overview of what's going on. We'll look at some of the safety features and the control features that they have to give you a, a safe nuclear reaction. And we'll finish off by looking at some of the mechanisms they use to deal with nuclear waste. Okay, so let's start off with generally what's going on in a nuclear reactor. So the first thing to get across is actually they're not that different to other kinds of reactors you'll come across. So like coal plants, oil plants, gas plants, all those kind of things, they all refer to the same principle. So they're all taking some form of stored energy, so be it like chemical, nuclear, whatever, they're turning that into thermal energy, and then they're using that thermal energy to increase the temperature of some water to vaporize it. And what you do is you create high pressure steam that flows along a tube through a turbine to a low pressure environment. And by spinning the turbine, you spin a generator that induces an EMF, which is what we know as electricity. So nuclear reactors work the same way, but there's a couple of key differences. And the key difference is in the process of actually gaining that thermal energy. Okay, so what's going on in a fission reaction? So, this whole process starts off with a neutron. That neutron needs to be fairly slow moving, so it's able to be bound into a nucleus of a uranium-235 atom. So once it's bound into the nucleus, that makes the nucleus unstable, and it will now undergo the process of fission. Without that extra neutron, it's not actually that unstable, um, so it won't undergo fission. So that's what happens and it splits up into what's called daughter nuclei. So you get three of them in this case, and you also get three additional neutrons released as part of the reaction, which can then go on to cause further fissions if you can modify their properties slightly. So that's, generally speaking, what's going on. So I've said here, sometimes it splits into two daughters, so you don't always get three like this. Sometimes you get two, sometimes you get one. It's not the same reaction every time, but on average, you get three neutrons for each one fission reaction there. So um, that's, generally speaking, what nuclear fission is. It's producing an unstable nucleus. That nucleus splits up, which is what fission is all about. OK, so um, there's a few problems with this. So if each reaction produces three neutrons, each of which can cause further reactions, you can see very quickly that this reaction is going to get out of control. So if it goes from 1, it goes to 3, goes to 9, goes to 27, it very quickly gets out of control. And that's what's called being supercritical mass. That just means, on average, each fission produces more than one fission. So it's going to get out of control. And you've got yourself a nuclear bomb. So that's how a nuclear bomb works. You want it to be exponential. That's why it's so devastating. So a bomb, a nuclear bomb, is a supercritical mass device. You want that. That's a good thing for a bomb. Well, good thing for a bomb. You have these things in your reactor called control rods. So what you can do is they are literally rod, like rods, and you can insert them into your reactor. And they're basically devices to absorb neutrons. So what you're aiming to do is ensure that each reaction, on average, produces one neutron, which means you effectively need to absorb two neutrons per reaction. So what you do is you kind of like move them in and out until you get exactly what you're looking for and you're controlling your reaction. So this is called being at critical mass when one neutron going in results in a fission which results in one neutron going out. That's critical mass. If you get it a bit wrong and put them too far in, what happens is you absorb more than two neutrons per reaction and actually you decrease the number of fission reactions over time. This is called being subcritical mass because essentially you're not this you're going to terminate the reaction because you're not going to produce as many neutrons as you need to continue at the same rate. So that's a problem with your control rods. Now, as a safety feature, every power plant will have a mechanism to actually drop the control rods in at a moment's notice. So you probably, they're probably sitting there somewhere with a massive red button, or more likely it's a computer program monitoring. And essentially if you hit it, or the computer detects a problem, it can whack the control rods right into your nuclear reactor. And if it does that, it absorbs all of the neutrons from the reaction, essentially puts a stop to the nuclear reaction. Now this is a 
sort of a device of last resort because once you stop the reaction, that's it for your power plant. Okay, so um, this is something that they wouldn't do lightly, but in an emergency, this is an option they have, and they can also flood the reactor with water as well, uh, which helps in other ways. Uh, but there's a few things you can do as a weapon of last resort. Okay, so that's what your control verbs are there for. Let's uh, talk about another thing that's inside your reactor, it's called a moderator. So for most nuclear reactors, this is water, and it's called light water in terminology, which is just regular water to you and me. Um, there are other types that use heavy water, uh, which is essentially water with an extra, um, extra like neutrons in it. And you also sometimes come across CO2 reactors as well. A few of them are like that, especially plutonium type reactors will have CO2. So the moderator's function is to slow down your neutrons. If your neutrons are traveling too fast, the strong force won't be able to pull them into the nucleus there. So you can't get, and then get an unstable nucleus, you can't have fission. Um, the way it, it was explained to me was like if you're playing golf, I don't know how many of you uh, do some putting, but the idea is if you just slowly roll the ball past the hole, it might like topple in, whereas if you hit it fast past the hole, it's more likely to rock it straight past. Um, that might help for the, those a few of you who play golf. Uh, but that's kind of the idea. Um, so you need slow moving neutrons to be able to do this. So um, essentially, as part of the process, your neutron will collide with the water molecule in this case that we're using. So I've represented the neutron as being red because it's very high kinetic energy or like a hot neutron. And we've got a either stationary or slow moving water molecule here. So that's like cold, if you like. And then as a result of the collision, a lot of the kinetic energy is transferred to the water so the water becomes hot, uh, which is another desirable outcome as well, because obviously we're looking to heat up water anyway. And then we've got a slow moving neutron called a thermal neutron. So it's now capable of causing a fission. So to put some um, numbers into this, typically after a fission, the neutrons will have a kinetic energy of two mega electron volts. Um, but to be a thermal neutron, they have to have energy below one electron volt. Okay, so we need to have a considerable Energy, energy reductions in it, as it says here, it takes about 20 elastic collisions to be able to bring a neutron down to the right speed there. So this is not going to be one collision, it's 20 or so, sometimes more, um, collisions, and we consider the collisions to be elastic, or the total kinetic energy is conserved. So to allow us to get elastic collisions, what we need is our moderator to be a similar kind of mass to uh, the neutron. Now obviously, this is difficult, um, obviously we're going to try and put atoms or molecules in as our moderator, but it would be much better if we could do something different. So the ideal thing we would put in as a moderator is hydrogen, um, because it's uh, very small, so you'd get the smallest number of collisions to bring down the energy. However, as some of you who've seen balloons exploding might have noticed, hydrogen is pretty dangerous and we don't really want them near a nuclear power plant. Something like helium might be good, but it's not in very great supply. So you just keep working your way along the periodic table, and the best thing you find to start with is water. CO2 is pretty decent as well. So that's kind of the logic they went through there. They're trying to minimize the number of collisions they need to bring the energy down, and the best thing they found is water. Okay, so that's your moderator. Now, in terms of putting the fuel in, you may have heard of a process called enrichment. A lot of the negotiations that go along with countries who are trying to develop nuclear power center around the idea of enrichment. Because if you can enrich, enrich a lot, that would allow you to build a nuclear weapon. If you enrich a little bit, that allows you to do nuclear power, and that's why it's such a contentious issue. And that's why you see a lot of countries claiming, you know, I'm just trying to build a nuclear power program but actually that process could then lead on to nuclear weapons, so it's always a difficult one. But enrichment as a general idea is the idea of increasing the percentage of 235 uranium, so uh, that would be its nucleon number. Because there are other isotopes, 238 and 234, but the problem with those is they don't release the neutrons as part of the fission reaction. Okay, So if those aren't really any good as a fuel, you'd end up with a reaction much lower than critical mass or sub-critical mass if we use those. So what we want is 235, because that's the nice one that releases three neutrons and allows us to have the chain reaction going on. Okay, the problem with that is, if we go and dig up some uranium, and in lots of countries have uranium mines, 
is they're about 0.7% 235. So seven parts in every thousand are 235. That's not great. So what we do is in a process of enrichment to increase the percentage. So what you do is you can, on a basic level, you can pass it through a membrane and separate out so we can increase the percentage. Not a lot, you can see here it goes to just above 1%, so it's not a lot, but it's better. And then we produce the offshoot of that's called depleted uranium, uh, which is essentially um, uranium with lower percentage 2 d 5 So we kind of split up the two, so we have enriched and we have depleted uranium there. Okay, um, so that's generally the process going on. And actually, uh, just a side fact here, your uranium 238, 234, 235, whatever, isn't actually naturally that dangerous at all. I think most people, if I said, can I give you some uranium? They'd be like, uh, no, that's really dangerous. Actually, it's not really. It's just an alpha emitter. So without inducing the fission with neutrons, actually uranium is just an alpha emitter, so a very simple barrier would make it very safe. Um, but I wouldn't go through trying to find some uranium. You might find the government's on your case about that. Okay, so that's enrichment. So let's have a look at some of the safety features of a nuclear power plant. So you can see here down here at the bottom, you probably can't read this. It says it's got a reinforced concrete containment shield. So this whole system is embedded within a concrete wall. So that stops the very dangerous radiations produced from this reaction escaping and firstly damaging the workers who work there and then the surrounding environment as well. So the problem here is uranium initially is only an alpha emitter so we just need a sealed container. So we've got the main container here is just sealed in steel so that deals with uranium. But the products of the reaction, however, are beta and gamma emitters. So these are much more dangerous for the workers and the general environment as well. That's why we use the thick concrete wall. It can absorb all of that beta and gamma radiation, and it can also absorb any stray high energy neutrons that escape from the reaction as well. So those are some of the safety features that you have involved there in your power plant. So the last thing to talk about is nuclear waste, and this is always the issue with nuclear power. And most environmental campaigners focus on the dangers of nuclear waste, and rightly so, there are some issues with it. So first thing is, nuclear waste, the stuff you produce after the reaction, has a half-life which is a very long period of time. So this waste will be active for hundreds if not thousands of years following the reaction. So it's a very long-term problem to deal with. So we have to find a way of storing it until it becomes safe again. So there's a few processes that you have to go through in order to do that. So first off, your waste products are really hot. So obviously you need to do something to cool them down. So every nuclear reactor will have something called a cooling pond as part of its design. So that's where you take spent fuel rods, put them in there, bring the energy down so they cool them up. Then for the most dangerous parts of your waste, uh, your beta and your gamma emitters, they put them through a process of vitrification, which basically means you turn them into glass. So the output is kind of sand-like in many ways. So you can actually turn it into glass the same way we turn normal silicon dioxide into glass. And that's called vitrification. And the product of that is then sealed in containers because we've got a mixture of alpha, beta and gamma in there. So we need to ensure it's completely sealed so it can't leak into the environment and become unsafe for the surroundings. The last thing you can see in this picture is you dig a very big hole and you stick all your barrels of waste deep underground where nothing's gonna come across them and your containers aren't gonna get damaged over time. So you need to think about your container to make sure it's not something that's gonna degrade over time, like animals aren't gonna be able to dig into it, that kind of thing. And you also bury it deep underground to stop that being a problem. You can see they've blocked it up concrete so like moles and stuff don't like dig their way in as well. So that's kind of how you deal with nuclear waste and we will have several sites like this across the UK where you store your nuclear waste and essentially wait a very long time. It's not even a few generations, we're talking hundreds if not thousands of years we have to wait here. Um, so that's how you deal with nuclear waste. So that concludes looking at nuclear power. I hope you found that useful. If you have any questions or queries, please do feel free to comment below and let me know. Um, but thank you very much for watching.